Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Um, uh, thank you all for uh, being here and thank you, Jeanette, for uh, hosting me here. Um, it's been great to be here in person. It's been uh, about six, six years, I think, since I last was at uh, Republica. Uh, and of course, in that time, a lot has changed, right? Uh, six years ago, I talked about how, how search works. Uh, and in that time, We've seen uh, technology progress at an unprecedented pace in, in the area of, uh, um, excuse me, I'm going to take this off while I speak. <laughs> this is a little bit distracting. Uh, so, um, yeah, so technology has progressed in, at an unprecedented pace uh, in the last few years uh, with generative AI. Uh, and I'm back here to tell you what this means uh, for search in particular and, and more generally for all of us in, in this context. Now, Republica's uh, motto this year is, who cares? Uh, and in this talk and in the discussion, I hope to convey that we at Google definitely care and have cared for a long time. Uh, and I hope to talk about Google's sort of responsible approach to AI uh, the, the motto we have is bold and responsible. Uh, so how to be innovative while still mitigating the risks. So Google itself uh, started with a question. Uh, it was how do you organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful? Uh, this is what we set out to do. This is our uh, mission statement. Uh, and so for almost two, years, uh, 20, uh, two decades now, uh, I've been at Google for 19 years, uh, my team and I have been focused on trying to produce the highest quality search results uh, for Google search. Uh, now, of course, understanding language is key to being able to do this well, because you need to understand the, the language of queries, the language of documents, and how they relate to each other. Uh, and so I've spent a lot of time working on large-scale approaches to, machine uh, to natural language understanding, which is, of course, a branch of uh, machine learning. Now, over the last few years, uh, uh, neural networks and language models sort of culminating in this uh, Gen AI uh, phenomenon uh, has, has made these huge uh, leaps forward in language understanding for, uh, for computers. Uh, and this acceleration uh, brings up many important questions for all of, uh, all of us to think about. So let me think, uh, let me discuss with you three questions that are top of mind for me. The first question is how has AI benefited the way we live, work, and learn, right? So throughout history, Whenever there have been moments of innovation or great technological change uh, that have profoundly impacted uh, human societies, um, th th there have been such moments in the past. So think about uh, the wheel, for example, which profoundly changed uh, trade and transportation. Uh, or think about the printing press, which profoundly impacted the dissemination of knowledge. Uh, or think about the steam engine that uh, created, that mechanized production and led to whole new industries being created. I think we stand at a, at a similar moment uh, in artificial intelligence. Now I know that uh, generative AI is all the rage right now, that's what everyone wants to talk about. Uh, but of course we know that AI is a lot more than just chatbots, right? Um, and so AI is already transforming a lot of different things, ranging from things like cancer imaging uh, to fraud detection. So let's just talk a little about how AI is already benefiting many, many uh, uh, situations. So a really great example is AlphaFold. Uh, so this is a system that uh, 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 Google DeepMind uh, uh, created. Uh, which generates the 3D structure of over 200 million proteins. Now, proteins are the building blocks of matter, uh, of, uh, of life, uh, and 
uh, the 3D structure is important because that's what leads to the understanding the function of the, of the protein. Because of this innovation, AlphaFold is accelerating research in biology uh, and medicine in dramatic ways. Uh, it's leading to new uh, uh, research on drugs for cancer, uh, for vaccines for malaria, uh, for enzymes uh, to, uh, to, to, to deal with like single-use plastics. So some of the big problems of our time. And it was able to do this, in, like in, in the past, uh, creating the, f finding the structure of a protein uh, was a multi-year task. Uh, and and AlphaFold was able to do it in a scant few weeks. Right, so that's a really great example. And more recently at Google I.O., uh, we announced, or uh, was it at Google? I, anyway, recently in May, uh, we announced uh, AlphaFold 3, uh, the latest generation of uh, AlphaFold, which not only looked at, uh, developed the structure of proteins, identified the structure of proteins, but identified the interactions of proteins with molecules like DNA and RNA and uh, uh, these ligands, uh, which are these small molecules that... Uh, um, and, and, and these interactions are sort of, especially for complex interactions, the predictions are much more accurate. And this is going to really be transformative uh, for drug discovery and protein engineering. Another great example uh, is early warning systems. So these early warning systems are essential in the, f uh, in the face of uh, climate disasters like wildfires and floods. Uh, being in California, I know all about uh, wildfires, and uh, being from India, I know that floods are a big problem. And I learned that in Germany, this is becoming increasingly a problem. So this is a problem that's affecting a lot of people. Uh, so to help with this, Google has developed these AI models uh, that accurately predict uh, 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 sort of flood levels and, and is able to make accurate real-time flood forecasts uh, and generate alerts out of it. Uh, the AI essentially helps you predict water levels and how they will evolve over time, and you can use that to build very detailed flood maps and depth charts, um, and we can and, uh, provide it openly. Uh, flood forecasting is now available uh, in 80 different countries, including Germany, uh, and, and uh, uh, it covers places where more than 460 million people live. So it's a, it's a sort of a big impact thing that AI is doing for us here. These are just a couple of small examples of this profound impact that AI is already ha having. And you can imagine lots of other examples uh, that you've no doubt heard of. So while it's fun to think about these really neat, innovative examples of the users of AI, uh, there's also the, the risk that is AI has the potential to worsen existing societal problems uh, like uh, uh, bias, for example, and to create new ones uh, like misinformation. So there's the, sort of the downside of AI even as we consider the, uh, the innovation here. And, and things like uh, misinformation are particularly important this year uh, where we have uh, uh, sort of about half the world's eligible population going up for elections, right? So th this is a pretty big problem in an election year for democracy if you have a lot of misinformation. So there are risks of AI, and so understandably people are also concerned about it. And this brings me to my second question, which is how can we mitigate the risks of AI even as we drive the innovation that we talked about uh, earlier? In other words, how can we build AI responsibly? So let me talk about something that is actually top of mind for us, and that is information quality. So people have important questions about whether AI will make mistakes, you know, hallucinations and so forth, uh, and whether it can generate and spread misinformation. This is a, this is a big problem. And to address these concerns, one of the many things we're doing is developing tools to help people evaluate information they find online. Um, uh, and this is a sort of a critical thing. So uh, the last time I was at Republica, uh, we had just started the work 
uh, of uh, uh, launching a search transparency tool called About This Result, which provides you all sorts of valuable information about a result so you can evaluate its uh, reputation and its trustworthiness for yourself. More recently, we've launched another information literacy tool called About This Image, right? Which tells you things about the image, such as when, uh, uh, where similar images are found, where the image first appeared, where else does this image appear, like in, on a news site or on a fact-checking site, uh, and, 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 and so forth. And so it gives you a great sense for context around the image, so you can learn about the authenticity of the image for yourself, right? So this is sort of a critical piece of, uh, uh, of uh, information literacy uh, to deal with misinformation. Uh, another good example of this uh, are some of the technical innovations that DeepMind is driving uh, with uh, digital watermarking. So they've developed a system uh, called SynthID, uh, which uh, adds a digital watermark to images, AI-generated images that they create. And this digital watermark, it's not just a layer that can be easily removed. It's sort of built into the pixels in some sort of a random stochastic way so that the signal can be extracted. Uh, and so we expect to be able to use this kind of digital watermarking uh, as it, uh, and have uh, creators be able to add it to their images uh, so that, you know, in search we can mark these images as being uh, uh, AI generated. And again, it gives you the context you're looking for. Uh, a third example of the kinds of things we're doing is uh, something that uh, the Jigsaw uh, team uh, at Alphabet at Google uh, developed called the Perspective API, uh, which is, uh, allows you to identify and mitigate toxicity uh, in, uh, in text. These can be comments, it's been used to uh, to do moderation, content moderation, assist with content moderation, but it can also be used uh, for uh, uh, LLM generated output. It's used in, uh, in Gemini uh, to identify toxicity and it's actually become uh, somewhat of a standard across the industry and is being used by a variety of the other LLMs for this purpose. And so that's a nice, uh, nice way to do this. So all of this work essentially is providing you more context about uh, the, the, the content you're seeing. And I think that's a really important piece uh, of a reliable ecosystem. Another part of uh, this question of who cares, uh, Caring in many cases involves taking an ethical position on, on the matter at hand. Uh, and that's exactly what uh, we've done at Google. We were one of the first companies uh, to develop and install a set of AI principles uh, that guide all of our AI-powered uh, 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 product development. Before you develop your product, you have to ask questions like, will it be socially beneficial? How will you build and test for safety? How will you incorporate uh, privacy design principles? So there's a set of things that we want to do uh, before you develop the product. But it also says, what are the things you will not do, right? So for example, uh, Google was one of the first companies to decide not to make a general purpose facial recognition algorithm available uh, as an API. Right? Uh, and the reason was we just didn't think there were adequate safeguards in place. And so that's a good example of uh, things that you won't do as a result of, uh, of this. Now we're at, at this pivotal moment in the development of AI, and we know that the choices that governments and industry and civil society together make at this early stage will shape its trajectory. And no single nation no single industry, no single company can do this by themselves. And so collaborating and having deep engagement is absolutely critical, even in situations like Republica here. And I'm heartened to notice that I've seen many examples of such collaboration between industries, between governments, between uh, various uh, civil organizations over the last year or, or years uh, that will help us get to the best place in, of uh, being able to govern and regulate AI. So that brings me to my last question, which is 
going back to the innovation point, when it comes to AI, what more is possible? Um, and just as the industrial revolution amplified our physical abilities, what we're seeing with Gen AI is open, that it's opening up new ways of thinking, working, and connecting. You just have to look at all the things people are doing to see this. And so even as we think about the risks, we shouldn't lose sight of the incredible opportunity that uh, uh, AI has uh, uh, that it can bring to us in our, in our societies. And we must focus on, our, on our, our attention on what we want to achieve, not just on what we want to avoid. It's very easy to get caught up in the sort of the downside, but don't forget the upside. There is real uh, uh, upside there. Uh, and this is actually what keeps me working at Google all these years. I think there's huge opportunity in Google search uh, I think it continues to be that ultimate moonshot, uh, and I'm very excited to be, uh, to be doing this. And so those were the three questions I had. How has AI benefited uh, a society already? How can we mitigate the risks of AI while fostering innovation? And what more is possible with AI? And let me just finish with one last question for us to think about, which is what are the things that we need to do today to realize a vision uh, where AI is both bold and responsible in the future, where there is innovation in a responsible way. What, what do we need to do today for both these things? And we need to think about these together, and I'm very excited to do that. Thank you. Now I can wear the headphones and not get confused. Thank you very much for this presentation. Now my role is that of the critical social scientist who will ask critical questions. Um, let's start with the following. Uh, critical observers, what they would say about most of the examples you presented they would describe this as technical solutionism. Would say, you provide new solutions to problems that you have created yourself. The good, ex uh, the good exception might be the face recognition software, where Google said, no, we don't do that. But many other issues, say perspective, say API, is an example for um, problems we have with content online that we wouldn't have before people could sort of put content online themselves. Before that, we had newspapers, right? And they were heavily curated. Now people put stuff online um, that is hate speech, that is manipulative, and I don't know what, and you provide solutions for problems you co-created. What do you say to critics who accuse you of technical solutionism? So, so I guess I, I guess I wouldn't uh, quite put it that way, um, because I think uh, putting it that way really seems to imply that uh, everything online is only bad. Mm -hmm. All the comments, all the content that people are putting up there is only toxic and has only downsides. And I think the truth is nothing could be further from the truth, right? There's a huge amount of benefit that people get from having people be online, from having a, a, a conversation uh, uh, online with other people, not just with uh, sort of uh, uh, people with, uh, I don't know, publisher voices, uh, which are important, don't get me wrong, those are important, but it's just as important to give people a voice. And we've seen over and over again how important that is in so many different situations. In fact, we have UX research that shows that more and more, and especially young people, want to hear from other people. Mm -hmm. This is what leads to the success of platforms like TikTok, for example where young people are hearing from other young people just like them about just a variety of uh, situations. This is the reason for the success of forums like uh, Reddit, for example, where again, people want to hear from other people. 
So there is a huge positive benefit to this uh, that wasn't true before these things came on. And as with any technology, there is a downside. And so then the question for us is, what's the response? Do we say, oh, there's a, there's a downside, and so we stop the whole enterprise? Because that's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? Which is why you need to develop solutions that mitigate those risks, such as the Perspectives API that identifies the toxicity, so you can identify it, do moderation, do all the various things that you would do with it, while still retaining the thing that is so amazing and powerful about having hum ordinary people be part of the conversation. I think this is critically important for, for society as a whole. Good point. Now, from a social science perspective, I would say information quality never depends on one single company or one producer of information. It is rather something that is co-produced by many different players. And of course, it also depends on the infrastructure um, that sort of facilitates the production of news and the commenting on news. What we see right now is that the infrastructure, particularly when it concerns AI, becomes controlled by, say, a handful of companies at the moment. Do you see this as a problem? Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know that uh, I, I quite agree with that premise, right? Um, today, Search, which is what I'm most familiar with, mm -hmm. Uh, is a platform that surfaces uh, content from just a wide, wide range of uh, millions of different uh, publishers. Some of them large publishers, some of them uh, bloggers, some of them uh, individuals, right? Uh, and, and we surface content from a variety of places. We go to great pains to surface multiple perspectives, multiple results, even for uh, news sites, publication houses, we have uh, a variety of places where we, 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 sh we surface content from different perspectives. The top stories carousel and search, for example, will show you results from a variety of places and you can click in to get full coverage and see even more sources of information on that. So I think it's absolutely the case that search goes to great pains to surface a variety of voices. Um, and uh, uh, so, so I, I, I would, and, and, and even as we bring AI to search, uh, this essential aspect of search is not going to go away. The variety will not go away, but the data produced to sort of train large language models is probably more monopolistic than further generations of digital technologies. Would you agree with that? No, the, the, the data used to produce these uh, large language models is in many ways, uh, in fact, uh, a distillation of everything that is out there on the web. Mm -hmm. So if anything, that training data is even more sort of, I guess I'll, I'll use the word democratic, but uh, more mm -hmm. sort of equal plane. It's not that you only take a small handful of voices and train it just on that perspective. This is why... Uh, uh, these large language models actually are able to talk on different perspectives in different ways uh, in there. So I don't think that is quite, uh, quite the case. Now, you might be referring to the fact that there's only a small handful of large language models, yeah. and maybe that is the, 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 the thing that you're more concerned about. Uh, even there, I would say, uh, yes, there are a, a handful of large language models, um, but there are also open source models and people are, are constantly finding ways to, to do things. And I've read articles, whether we believe these or not, but I've read articles that imply that open source models are the ones that are going to win out in the, in the future only because it unleashes the creativity of a lot more developers. Now, you may or may not believe that, but that's certainly a perspective out there. Yeah, so, I think a Googler even published, he did not publish, but uh, wrote such a paper. Exactly. So, so my only point is 
that yes, this, the, the, the technology has become uh, uh, expensive to, to create, mm -hmm. but there are enough uh, uh, opportunities out there to use these LLMs. All of these things are also being offered as cloud services, so third parties can go use it for their purposes. That's why you're seeing an explosion of startups, for example, uh, not all of whom are building their own, mm -hmm. uh, but they're also building, uh, building on top of the existing ones. And I will add that uh, I was in India in December uh, at a similar conference there. There was the Global Partnership on AI conference mm -hmm. there. And one of the really interesting things I found there was there was so much interest in building an India-specific LLM right, which addressed the specific needs of India where there are, you know, I don't know, 20 odd different languages. So they really wanted an LLM that fully understood all of the various languages in India and took training data for all of them and so forth. And I think this is, this is fantastic. So I, I suspect this is going to happen uh, more and more as we see, but the, 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 uh, the truth is, as of now, to build a truly large uh, model, it does take, uh, is costly, and so it takes time. Your colleague at Meta, Jan Lequin, is one of the proponents of open source large language models. And uh, the argument that he repeatedly uh, brings forth for that is that he says large language models are too important to be controlled by a few companies. Do you agree or disagree with his position? So, uh, so first, I, may, I should add that uh, Google also has put out uh, an open source model, uh, a version of Gemini called mm -hmm. Gemma, I think. Mm -hmm. So I think we're well aligned with the idea that, uh, that, that we should have uh, uh, open source models. Because, as I said, it unleashes the creativity of a lot of developers. We've seen over the years how open source has been such a successful uh, process. So I absolutely agree with that. Um, but I want to get back to your earlier point that one of the risks which we should go in with our eyes open on, and I'm not saying this is the reason to not do it, but one of the risks with doing it, of course, is that it allows anyone to misuse those LLMs for tasks such as creating mm -hmm. uh, uh, misinformation at scale, mm -hmm. for example. So again, we get back to that original conundrum we talked about. There's lots of benefit, but there are also risks. And so even as we take any of these choices, in this case, uh, open sourcing models, we should be cognizant of the risks and find ways to mitigate the risks in our products. We do this in in Google search a lot, actually, to mitigate the risks of misinformation and, and things like that, even in the face of uh, uh, large-scale uh, abuse from uh, large language models. Um, but focus on the benefits also. The question of risks I find quite interesting. As some of you may be aware, the uh, EU is now issuing more and more risk-based forms of regulation. The Digital Service Act has a large risk component and the AI Act also wants to mitigate, regulate risks and ask large companies such as Google to sort of assess risks themselves and issue risks, I mean reports about those risks. Now, I would be interested when you say you do that with Google search anyway, how do you go about these risks? How do you define them and how do you mitigate them? Yeah, so let, let me talk about uh, sort of the, the uh, one of the big risks that we have been uh, dealing with for several years now, uh, uh, which is the risk of misinformation. Right, that that has been a, one of the big risks in uh, uh, in 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 search. Uh, there have been other things that we've also dealt with, but this this gives a good case in point. Um, so when you have misinformation, there's a uh, there's a question of how do you mitigate that risk. Now, the way we went about it is as follows: uh, we essentially doubled down on a strategy that uh, was in place 
when Google first started. So when Google first started, there were lots of search engines around, but Google was the first one that said, it's not enough to surface relevant results. You need to surface relevant results from reliable sources whenever possible. Right, and the notion of reliability, if you remember, that they introduced was this, uh, this algorithm called PageRank, which is a citation uh, uh, algorithm based on links between pages. Right, and so uh, PageRank gave you a measure of quality. Right, and, and so that became sort of the, the key uh, sort of secret sauce of Google is, uh, uh, or, or key uh, goal of Google was to surface relevant results from reliable sources whenever possible. Now, over the years, we've added many more notions of quality, and we have formalized what a high or low quality page is in a document which we call the Search Rater Guidelines. It's a public document, anyone can go look at it, and so you can go look at it and see what do we mean by a high quality document, what do we mean by a low quality document. It talks about things like expertise and authority and trustworthiness and experience. Um, and, and these types of things. And you can ask yourself, yeah, this does seem like a, a reasonable notion of quality, or maybe you disagree with it, in which case you, know, you, can, you can communicate, because it is a public document that you can, uh, you can comment on. And so when we looked at the problem of misinformation, the solution we came up with is for queries where um, um, the, uh, there is a risk of misinformation and we were able to identify such queries, uh, there's usually a balance between relevance and quality. You want relevant results from sort of quality sources whenever possible and there's a balance here. And we developed this notion that we call flight to quality to say that in those cases where misinformation is possible, you increase the weight of the quality portion of this function so that you emphasize quality more in those cases. The result is that the, res the results that we surface in, in these cases uh, tend to be from more reputable, more high quality sources. And the hypothesis is that these sources will not indulge in misinformation. Um, and that is actually what has happened in search, and that's why for the most part, you won't find a lot of misinformation in search because of uh, algorithms like this. And it's important to notice that what we did not do, we did not go and try to identify a piece of content as being misinformation or not, because we don't think we can do that at scale, right? We can do this at scale, identify quality of uh, uh, or reputation of, uh, of uh, pages, because that's what we've done since the start. And so we had the tools to do this. So that's an example of how we go about mitigating uh, a significant risk that we were facing, you know, six years ago. And have you, I mean, should I imagine that Google employs professional risk researchers who look out for new issues related to search or other products from Google? So, uh, I, I guess I hadn't thought of them as professional risk researchers, uh, but we have an active trust and safety team. Uh, and the trust and safety team is not only charged with uh, mitigating risks uh, or mitigating problems that are policy violating in search, but they're also charged with identifying emerging risks. Uh, and so they research, uh, uh, I don't know, the internets and, and so forth to identify emerging risks and they raise it with the engineering team so we can develop uh, additional solutions as necessary. And that you now also do for the regulator in Brussels? So for the regulator in Brussels, you're talking about the DSA uh, regulation in this case. This is the Digital Services Act and the Digital Services Act has among uh, in, in, in its uh, uh, requirements uh, that uh, large platforms such as Google Search uh, give a, a, a list of the risks that they're looking at and produce a report on how they're responding to those risks. Uh, and so we are absolutely complying with that. Uh, and I think we've produced uh, or are close to producing a, a, a report for the regulator 
I saw an early copy of it uh, a few weeks ago, so I know it's. I, I don't know whether it's actually been filed or not, but I know it's it's there and ready. And I think we're going to be, have a, a summary for public consumption um, in, in in short order after mm -hmm. that. Speaking of regulation, one of the criticisms of the AI Act have been that the AI Act focuses so much on risks but doesn't really sketch out a positive future for AI. And I've been wondering whether you agree with that criticism and think that the regulator should, for example, define or operationalize what they mean by so-called um, public interest AI? Do you think that should be the job of a regulator to define, sort of give a normative uh, perspective on technology development in this field? So, so here's, here's, here's a perspective that I would have, right, on, on regulation. I, I do think Regulation for AI is important. I think Sundar, our CEO, has come out and said AI is too important not to regulate. But the risk with all regulation is that it becomes so onerous that it uh, impedes um, uh, innovation. Right. So you have this has to be done with care if we want to encourage innovation. Right. I, I think that's the sort of message. Now there are elements of the AI Act which actually are, I think, really good, right? So they have this, uh, I think the phrase is uh, proportionate uh, risk-based uh, risk uh, uh, assessment uh, 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 of, of risks, right? So uh, the idea being that uh, the, the safeguards or the, 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 the actions have to be proportionate to the actual risks involved. But even this turns out to be a, sort of a very context-dependent, nuanced issue. So what, just to give you an example, just to see how complicated things can become, uh, one of the things that the AI Act identifies is that you shall not uh, identify emotions on, in people. Right? That's an example of it which actually makes a lot of sense. You don't want on social media to have your picture taken and someone saying, oh, you're depressed. And I mean, all of that sort of just feels like a, a big violation of in, in various ways. Makes a lot of sense. But now imagine you're in Google Photos uh, and you take a burst of pictures and you want photos to pick out the best picture for you. And in the best picture, maybe that's the one in which everyone is smiling. Now, is that emotion that is this thing? And should that be uh, uh, sort of uh, prevented by the AI Act? That feels like an overreach to me, right? And so the whole thing is, is very nuanced. I think the AI Act or other regulations should be identifying these guardrails about things that is very much like how Google decided they weren't going to do a facial recognition API. So similarly, having guardrails guardrails that are proportionate with the, 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 the task. If, it's, if you're looking for home, if you're using AI for home loan uh, uh, valid uh, uh, approvals, well, maybe the standard is very high on making sure that you don't have bias. Uh, that example also points out another thing, that in many cases, the, 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 the the, the remedy, if you will, or the, the constraint that is put should be in place whether or not you use AI. There should be parity between AI solutions and non-AI solutions. Like in the home loan case, if you're not using AI to, to approve your home loans, does it mean you're free to, to have any bias you want? Well, of course not. You should have the same standard that you, is applied to the AI. Um, only that with a machine, you can sort of develop standards that determine bias, whereas yeah. with a human being, that is much more difficult. And, but, but, but it's equally important with the human being, because otherwise that feels like a big uh, loophole to me. Yeah, it now feels like a loophole, but it has always been biased. Yeah. I think we are introducing standards that also make us look at... Uh, decisions by human beings in a different way. Exactly, exactly. 
But still, the question is what kind of uh, guidelines, what kind of framework of regulation would you find positive? I mean, one could say if there is a framework that regulates the markets for all, then you can you know uh, what you can compete against and what is out of bounds. That would be something you would agree on, presumably? I think so, I think so. But my, my, I think my larger point is that you don't want onerous uh, um, uh, regulations that impede innovation. You can't, you can't dictate innovation through regulation, but you sure can stop it. Right, yeah, and so that's the, the thing that we have to be careful about. But when, you, when we come back to the example of face, regula uh, face recognition software, that is innovation in a way, but you decided not to go down that path. So would you also support in certain areas uh, measures that are called technology bans? Uh, I'm not sure I understood technology bans, but I can imagine... Uh, government making regulations about things even like face recognition like face recognition just to give you an example of governments already doing this I know a lot of city governments in the US but also I think in Germany uh, don't allow face recognition for their police uh, but it's forces used anyway. that may be the case but then they're not doing it uh, uh, in in The, the regulation says they should not use it, right? And so this is a case of society making that choice. There are other societies where they have not made that choice, and that's okay, right? I think we have to make these choices very clearly, uh, depending on what, what your society actually wants. But, but if, we, if we overreach on it, then other very legitimate uses... I think medical cases is a, is a really great example. I think there's lots of opportunity in medicine uh, to actually build much better uh, uh, personalized medicine and, and, and so forth with, with artificial intelligence. I give you examples of what AlphaFold is doing. Uh, but we need to enable the researchers in this, the doctors and, the, and, and, and them, Uh, in ways that actually lets them use AI to develop the solutions they need. But you didn't evade my question, did you, about uh, face recognition software. You said Google decided not to commercialize It's it. It's true. And there was a reason for that. It's true. So, uh, but, but if your point was this is innovation and yet we didn't do it. Yeah. But that's okay. I, I'm not saying that every innovation is a good innovation. Mm -hmm. right? Just because it's new, just because it has a new capability is no reason why we must do it. Right? And, and it's perfectly okay for a society or a company, but preferably a, a society to say, no, we won't do this, uh, this kind of innovation. Um, even though other societies might choose otherwise. That is true, but of course, if a government would decide we don't, we don't uh, allow for face recognition, uh, recognition software to be developed or, um, or sold, then you could sort of make that decision without losing out against your competitors. It certainly makes it much easier if the government decides that. Right? In our case, we decided that without the government deciding, and sometimes companies will do that, but it's certainly easier to do it if the government decides this or it becomes an industry norm. I think uh, in the area of uh, biology with CRISPR, there has been a lot of sort of self-regulation on the use of CRISPR uh, to... Um, Uh, to not uh, uh, manipulate stem cells that can go on to reproduce uh, 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 other human beings, for example, right? And, and, and I think that's, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yeah. But uh, we can see at the same time that the more globalized the world has become, the more difficult it is to set rules that would apply to all countries and all producers. Yeah. 
it, it has definitely become harder and maybe maybe that's a bridge too far to get all countries on the same page. Uh, but to the extent that I'll give you sort of the industry perspective on this. I think having a patchwork of regulations uh, that are different in the US, in the EU, in India, in Australia, in Brazil, having different regulations in all of these places makes it very difficult for companies uh, to bring products to market. Right? So to the extent that all the countries and uh, regions that are willing to cooperate on this. This is what the, the global partnership on AI that I uh, attended uh, uh, in December in India, uh, that, that was part of the goal is to try and get a variety of different countries to at least agree on a consistent framework for uh, regulation. Uh, so that's just something for us uh, to keep in mind or for regulators to keep in mind that without it, you get this sort of patchwork of uh, regulations, which makes it very hard for all companies, not just Google. It just may, and actually, it becomes even harder for smaller companies to to uh, to deal with a sort of a bewildering array of uh, regulations. Yeah, that's the old dilemma yeah. uh, for small countries. What is doable for you might turn out to be deadly for small producers. Exactly. Having said that, uh, we would like to now open the floor for questions. Here's someone. Thank you for your talk. Uh, you pointed out how dangerous misinformation is, especially in this uh, year of elections and explain the responsible AI guidelines that you have and the extensive experience with quality control. And my question is now how in this context it could happen that uh, the AI you integrated to search uh, gives out the dangerous conspiracy theory that uh, former President Barack Obama is a Muslim. Uh, what, went, what went wrong w uh, with your responsible AI measures? in this case. So I think you're referring to a uh, recent escalation over the last week or so as part of our uh, uh, launch of the AI overviews, uh, where we had uh, that very uh, 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 result uh, show up. So let me just give you some context on, 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 on that launch and, and, and what we did. The first thing to note is, uh, a large number of the problems uh, that were reported actually constitute a very tiny uh, collection of actual uh, queries, right? These were all infrequent queries that uh, took place. The vast majority of queries where the AI overviews triggered actually triggered very high quality responses uh, and they've been uh, received very well by users in all of our testing and our experimentation. Uh, we've also done extensive testing beforehand to, uh, to address many problems before they came up. Now, having said that, some problems did come up, right? And we are uh, uh, we're not happy about that, right? Uh, uh, I, I do want to set the expectation, though, that however much pre-testing you do, uh, we're in a situation where new sit uh, problems can always crop up because there's this rather remarkable statistic uh, that, uh, that, uh, that is true, uh, that I still have a hard time believing, but it's true, which is that 15% of the queries we get every single day are ones that we've never seen before. So there's incredible novelty in the query stream. Uh, and so anticipating every single problem is just not going to happen. On the other hand, what we can do is when these problems arise, uh, we can rapidly develop solutions to address them. And that's exactly what the team did in that particular case and in all the other, uh, there was a whole lot of uh, cases involving jokes that uh, were highlighted as part of this launch. And they were able to go in and and address these over this last week uh, to address those problems. So what the commitment you have from us is, this is actually really important to us. As, as we said uh, at Republica, we care.
We care deeply about this. We can't guarantee that there will never be problems, but we can guarantee you that we take every problem seriously and we will respond, which we have in this case. There's another question over there. I have a question. Hello, thank you for um, the talk. Um, earlier in your presentation, you said that um, we need to be part of the conversation. You need to put the microphone closer to your mouth. Okay. Um, earlier, now okay? Okay, perfect. Earlier in your presentation, you said being part of the conversation is a good thing, and I agree. Um, so through uh, social media platforms, such as Reddit, for example, you mentioned, um, we have the possibility to be part of the conversation. Um, but I think there's also a downside. Um, for example, we know that AI also discriminates. Um, and I ask you very critically because I think that, and maybe, yeah, I can take that away. I think that companies, especially with such a huge power like Google has, they have a responsibility in this entire debate. Where do you see your responsibility and what do you do to basically counter um, this, yeah, let's say, statement and this problem of discrimination in the AI sphere and in those tools? So, so it's hard for me to uh, talk sort of in broad terms about uh, discrimination in AI per se, because that can mean a lot of different things. My own perspective on these issues, which I think are very serious and I want to take them very seriously, is that it's the, the problems are, it's not enough to address problems in AI models. They need to be addressed in the end-to-end -end system. And that's the crucial point. And the end-to-end -end system that I'm most familiar with, of course, is search, which has AI built in, in in various ways. And so over the years, we've developed various methods for trying to mitigate some of the kinds of, uh, we think of these as product inclusion risks, right? Discrimination of various sorts, various fairness things. We've limited the kinds of information that we use, signals we use in our uh, ranking algorithms, so we are unable to make certain distinctions uh, that can lead to sort of bias and so forth. Um, and so we do a lot of things. We have special efforts. Uh, a, a good example that I can highlight here Uh, is in image search, for example. Um, uh, we've had in the past uh, challenges with uh, representation in people-oriented queries. Uh, the prototypical query is a query like CEO, uh, which was surfacing uh, only white male CEOs, right? And so we have had uh, uh, concerted efforts in, in areas like this Uh, to add diversity to these queries, gender diversity, uh, uh, ethnic and racial diversity, in appropriate ways, uh, still reflecting the core value that Google has, which is relevant and high quality results. But the, those rater guidelines I was talking about earlier point out that in addition to being relevant and high quality, when, when those things are in place, Diverse, a set of diverse results is better than a set of non-diverse results. And so it biases us towards having greater diversity. Does that mean we have no problems? Of course not, because again, uh, the problem is not easy to solve. But are we making concerted efforts in that direction? Absolutely we are. This matters to us. Can I ask a follow-up question on that one? Uh, when it comes to sort of notions like toxicity or healthiness, of a public debate. There is no non-biased way of deciding what is toxic and what is not toxic. So how do you handle that, particularly against the background of different cultures and also cultures within a country permanently changing? So, so there are two, two separate answers I have for this, right? One is what do we do in search? And then the other is, what do you do with content moderation? And I separate these out because in search, we do not do content moderation except in a very, very small set of policies 
which aren't about toxicity per se, but they're things like, uh, I mean, really, really bad things like child pornography and uh, things that are legal removals, that, that kind of thing. So there's a small set of policies that we have where we can interfere manually, but for the most part, we do it uh, algorithmically, right? And in, in the algorithmic stage, the, the way we address sort of this bias uh, uh, one way or the other is, again, through our uh, rater guidelines, right? Uh, the idea is that we use things like uh, the quality of pages to decide whether or not to surface them uh, as, as part of the ranking thing. But to get the quality of page, you have, we have hundreds of billions of pages in the internet, right? And we need to get a quality score for each one. So how do we do that? Uh, so we've got these rater guidelines that articulate what is high quality, what is low quality. We put it in front of raters. These are raters, there's a diverse set of raters from across the world. There are more than 15,000 of them across the world. So they bring local context to bear in, in doing this. Uh, they produce hundreds of thousands or millions of uh, training instances uh, of toxicity, uh, not toxicity, of quality, I'm sorry. And then we generalize that signal into the one for uh, hundreds of billions of pages, right? And so that attempt is an attempt at dealing with this bias because essentially the signal comes from uh, this large collection of raters, diverse collection of raters from across the globe, uh, from urban centers, from smaller towns, from all, from all over the place, that allows us to have some modicum of addressing that bias question. Uh, in the context of uh, moderation, which honestly I have less experience in because, as I said, search doesn't do that kind of uh, uh, moderation, there I think the the answer is uh, to have a clearly listed set of policies uh, that you can highlight to anyone uh, that says this is what we moderate against. So that you tried, if, if there is a bias, then it is built into the, 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 the publicly available thing, which someone can object to, to say, no, this is not the case or, or what. The, um, so you, you need to have that mm -hmm. very clearly in place. Okay, we have time for perhaps two further questions. Um, yeah. Um, I put my thoughts down as well. <laughs> yeah. So first of all, uh, thank, um, thank a lot for the talk. Um, so yeah, my question is a few months ago, uh, it was revealed that Israel, the Israeli army is using an AI powered system called Lavender to generate military targets, uh, along another AI system that goes under the terribly cynical name of uh, Where is Daddy, which notifies when a target is located in their designated family home. These systems rely on the mass surveillance of Palestinian people as training data, which is enabled by cloud computing services such as Project Nimbus, of which Google is part of. Um, now, my question, how does this use align uh, with Google's policy of ethical AI and maybe to take up what you said before, uh, for what did you Google care when participating in Project Nimbus? So, uh, that's a great question. Um, I have to admit that I'm not the, the expert on all of the aspects of Project Nimbus. Uh, what I can say with certainty is that they did not use Google AI to develop targeting or uh, surveillance uh, technology. Uh, I think Project Nimbus was about uh, uh, less uh, uh, serious types of things, of, about having the Israeli government use uh, Google Workspace and other such uh, functionality in, in, the, in, the, in, in their business. Um, as I said, I'm not the expert on Project Nimbus, uh, but I know that the, the team has thought seriously about it and we can get uh, a better answer from someone from uh, cloud uh, for you in this. But I'm confident we did not do any uh, weapons targeting or anything with, uh, with that. I think we have to 
close the panel now. Uh, our time is over. Thank you so much for this very interesting conversation. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.